I want to share with you our experience of 10 years of super linear slowness in clock. I think all of the presentations so far have mentioned performance issues in one way or another, and I hope to give a more coherent picture of them here. This wasn't quite what I was expecting when I started my PhD, but I've spent something like 80% of my time being plagued by performance issues in call and working around them. And I've also heard similar complaints about performance issues from others, and I think every single talk so far today has mentioned performance issues at least once. In particular, there's performance issues with Cox group engine. In order to apply proof assistance to industry scale applications, we need automation. The problem is that there is something like a 10x to 100x overhead in number of lines of verification over number of lines of code being verified. Here you can see the numbers for some successful verification projects. And what this means is that if we want to, mod to verify even a modest program, we need to put in an enormous amount of effort to do the verification. And moreover, many industrial scale proofs are full of boring and tedious case analysis, proving that integer addition doesn't overflow in a couple thousand slightly different cases is not anyone's idea of a fun proof. At least it's not my idea of a fun proof. Adequate automation, by contrast, allows verification of new code with negligible marginal overhead. And here you can see that in my main project, we managed to have more lines of code that we are verifying than we spend verifying that code. You might be familiar with proof automation in the form of LTAC or LTAC2 or MTAC or Metacoff or Coff LP. And I want to talk about automation at a slightly different layer for this talk. The proof engine is the interface of functions that manipulate the proof state. And this is the interface that proof scripts are built on top of. What this means, uh, sorry, you can think of the basic LTAC or LTAC2 primitives as the proof engine or perhaps the OCaml functions underneath them as what I mean by proof engine. And this means, for example, that rewrite is not part of this fundamental interface. It's something that should be built on top of the proof engine. And it would be nice to have a minimal orthogonal performance interface. As far as I know, we don't have this. Proof assistants prove things by type checking proof terms. And so what we want from a proof engine, what we want from this basic interface is modular incremental construction of proof terms. We want modularity because we want feedback at the location of error. If you write a long proof script and at the end of it, you get an error message saying something failed somewhere. That's not very useful. <laughs> you want to get the error message right where the thing failed. We also want incrementality. Everything should be doable in parts. You shouldn't have to leave the proof engine to construct your proof term and then give it all at once with refine. You should be able to stay within the proof engine for the entire construction. Otherwise, there is something lacking in your interface. And finally, we want to do this all efficiently because the performance of the fundamental building blocks is what determines the performance of the tactics built on top of them. The tagline for this presentation is Poppelmark for Proof Engines. The Poppelmark challenge was a set of benchmarks for mechanizing the meta theory of programming languages. It stimulated discussion, collaboration, and progress by providing both a measuring stick and a call to action. And I'm claiming that we want both of these things for performing proof engines. We want both the measuring stick and we want the call to action. This talk, this presentation, will sketch the most salient ways that we find calls. Current proof engine inadequate, with three examples and roughly three that fall more or less into three categories. The superlinearity of performance bottlenecks in call, the whack-a-mole-like nature of debugging performance problems where the same bottlenecks in fundamental building blocks keep showing up again and again in slightly different ways across various tactics. And finally, the incoherent nature of the performance landscape in Calk, where you can't just know the asymptotics of the building blocks and then apply that framework to get the asymptotics you want. Performance issues in Calk are egregious because they are super linear. How bad are they? They are at least 4,000 millennia bad. Real world example from my PhD. You can see here a performance plot 
where a proof script that worked fine on an example of size two taking 17 seconds, although you can't see that on this plot that has about a week in time, was projected to take over 4,000 millennia on an example of size 17. <laughs> no one has that long to wait. I certainly don't. The tactic that was at the root of this performance issue was abstract reflexivity. This is not a particularly complicated tactic. The thing that it's doing is just saying, show that these things are equal, not by proof search, just by conversion, and then check that there are no problems in the proof. And the reason that it was slow is because of black box conversion heuristics. Let me show you by example. This is not an exact match for what was going wrong, but it was very, very close. Suppose you want to unify 10 factorial with 10 times 9 factorial. You have four choices. You can heuristically reduce factorial on the left by one step, turning 10 factorial into 10 times 9 factorial. This is what you want to do in this case, because at this point you can just see that they are obviously the same and be done. You can heuristically reduce the multiplication on the right by one step. This is very bad in this case, because you turn 10, fact 10 times 9 factorial into 9 factorial, plus 9 times 9 factorial, which becomes 9 factorial plus 9 factorial plus 8 times 9 factorial. Maybe you can see where this is going, and if I spelled them all out, we'd be here well past the end of the conference. But if you tell Bob to do this, it might decide to do this and fully reduce 10 times 9 factorial to a numeral, after which it discovers that that numeral is not the same thing as the factorial function applied to 10, and so it does the same thing on the other side. <laughs> this is very slow. Only slightly less bad is if you decide to fully reduce both sides from the very beginning. The fourth option is that you demand conversion hints from the user. You say, well, you haven't told me what I should be doing to decide that these things are the same, so I'm just going to tell you that I don't know how to do it yet. Heuristics are hard to debug. The problem is not that we have heuristics, though it's bad that the default heuristics can take an unpredictable, arbitrarily long amount of time. The point here is that it's unclear what's best. There is no obviously best heuristic. I claim that 4 should at least be an option. If you want to write predictably performant automation, you should be able to tell the proof engine, don't use proof steps that could take an unpredictably long amount of time. Once you track the performance issue down to this issue, though, it's relatively easy to fix. You can give conversion hints to Coq, although you can't say, don't go anywhere without conversion hints. The strategy command lets you do this in one line, 10 or 20 characters. You basically say, unfold factorial before you unfold multiplication. You add this line of code, or we did, and that fixes the problem. It turns the exponential black line into the very flat green line. But when you zoom in, it is still exponential. I didn't bother spending the time to track down this issue, because by the time I had tracked it down to this point, Fiat Crypto had moved on. And in our case, we only needed examples of size 17, which only take, what is this, five minutes? A little bit less than five, four or five minutes. So we could do that here. But performance problems are pervasive, and solving them is like playing whack-a-mole. Part of the issue is that conversion is one of the building blocks of the tactic engine. And it is one of the building blocks that bottlenecks many tactics. It is everywhere. Fixed point refolding is turning bare fixed points back into global constants. It uses something akin to conversion. It is the bottleneck behind the notorious slowness of simple and CDN. It also perhaps surprisingly shows up in HNF, which reduces terms to have normal form. It shows up in intro. It shows up in inductive type checking. It used to show up in all of type inference. And the performance depends on the size of the fixed point body, which means that if you're hitting this bottleneck, there is a very easy fix that might buy you a couple orders of magnitude speed up, which is that you take the body of your fixed point, you move it to a separate definition, and change basically nothing else. Extraction until COC 816 fully reduced types in some cases for no particularly good reason. Decided quality still fully reduces types in some cases for no particularly good reason. Set occurs modular unification when there are holes. Holes are places where you don't give the term fully explicitly, where there's implicit arguments or underscores, and they turn into EVARs, existential variables, which I will come back to later. Set does not occur modular unification when there are no holes. Destruct does more conversion than you might think. Clear body requires conversion to ensure well-typedness. This is perhaps surprising. 
but it is needed when you think about it uh, in enough detail. Rewrite does conversion and unification. This is sometimes desirable. The problem is that there is no way to fully turn it off. It's inadequately configurable. Similarly, apply does conversion. Again, this is often desirable, but it is hard to control. The fixing performance issues from one tactic often just reveals performance issues from the next tactic, and this is not a complete list. We've seen one instance, one more or less concrete instance, where solving one performance problem just uncovers another one. And I hope that this next example will give more of a sense of the superlinear whack-a-mole. The setup here is doing weakest precondition proving for imperative code verification, where you have some concrete function and some precondition that you can assume about that function and a concrete postcondition. And a weakest precondition predicate will compute the weakest precondition such that your function will satisfy the postcondition. And then you want to prove that your precondition implies the weakest precondition. And the real world example that we're considering is ChaCha20. And essentially, the only thing you need to know about ChaCha20, which is a cryptographic algorithm, is that it is largely a single loop that has 96 assignments. The other thing you need to know is that the variables are used multiple times, and so in order to avoid superlinear blow-up in goal size, you need to introduce let binders for the variable values. We can't just inline them after each assignment. And we absolutely want to avoid superlinear blow-up whenever we can. The original proof here, by the way, was contributed by J.M. Gerson. Andres, my co-author for this talk, spent a significant amount of time performance debugging it. And then we worked together to distill the essential performance bottlenecks in this example. The way that weakest precondition proving works is that you start with the first assignment and you introduce two let binders, one for the new value of the variable, which is a whole, an existential variable here, and another one for the new state. And you have a side condition that talks about the value of the variable. And the side condition can essentially be proven with repeats e exists, repeat split reflexivity, which instantiates the value of the variable. And then you can strip off the next assignment, introducing two more let binders, another side condition, and prove that again with the same tactic, instantiating the next e bar. And we do this 96 times. The performance of this, when I came upon this proof, is that it timed out after about two hours on CI or ran out of memory variously. In reconstructing the example, I was unable to quite reproduce this behavior. The verification of the loop body took only 70 seconds. But I believe that the performance bottlenecks are representative, and so I will lead you through my performance debugging. And again, I hope to give you a taste of the whack-a-mole-like nature of solving performance issues in COF and the incoherency of proof engine performance, the extent to which the performance bottlenecks have nothing to do with the proof that we're proving. The first thing to do, as always, when performance debugging is profile. COF has LTAC prop, which lets you profile LTAC code. And we get a profile looking like this. The thing to note in this profile is that clearly something has gone wrong with clear taking up almost half the time. The relevant number here that we're looking at is that it is called 188,438 times in our proof. Why are we calling clear so much? The answer is that many tactics are slower in large contexts than in small ones, so it does make sense to clear out unused hypotheses. Perhaps not 188,000 times in one proof, though. The reason we end up invoking clear so often is because of the algorithmics forced by the obvious and perhaps only way to clear out unused hypotheses in LTAC. This is the straightforward way to clear out unused hypotheses. It basically says, look for hypotheses of various types, attempt to clear them, and repeatedly do this in a loop. The problem with this tactic is that it is cubic. This is sad. <laughs> the reason that it's cubic is that every invocation of clear needs to walk the entire context to make sure that that variable can be cleared. That is one factor of context size. Match goal iterates over all of the hypotheses searching for one to clear. That is the second factor of context size. And finally, repeat match goal starts again after every bit of context, or sorry, after every bit of progress. That is a third factor of context size, and so we end up with three factors of context size and our sad cubic performance. 
I tried to write an asymptotically better cleanup in LTAC2, but it was a performance regression. <laughs> Even after profiling, the proof engine does not make it easy to write efficient code. The obvious thing to try to improve here is to do some sort of caching or amortization of costs, but the proof engine doesn't actually let you amortize costs in most cases, certainly not while staying within the safe building blocks and getting error messages at the location of error. There's no way to amortize the check of clear over the context or to cache the, uh, or there's not an easy way for sure to cache when things change in the context. It's not even clear what the right interface to expose is, what sorts of things we need to be able to cache and amortize. And this is part of the Pavel Marker Proof Engines quest, to discover what the right challenges we need to meet are and what the right interface to expose is, what the right things to be able to cache and amortize or how to be able to cache and amortize things. The next obvious question is can we just skip clear? Because if you remember, we had it only for performance reasons. And indeed we can, but it will come back to bite us later. After removing clear, just removing it entirely, and doing some other performance optimizations, I cut the time in approximately half and got this profile. And the thing to notice here is refine. Refine is taking up 80% of the time almost. And the thing that refine is doing in our proof is a variant of reflexivity. Again. If you recall the side condition slide, we had some equality goals that we were solving with reflexivity. To get this to show up in the profile, I had to replace it with refine e grepple. It should never be called. What do you mean? It should. Uh, it never be yes, split. yes. If, if I do it exactly like this, it gets called by split. The actual tactic is a little bit more complicated to not invoke repeat, and so, yes. Um, if it's exactly as written, it never gets called. This is a close match for what the, what the uh, code is doing. And what I want to t uh, share with you now is some different ways of saying reflexivity. Because when you are trying to solve performance issues, that's what you do. There are 258 equalities that we have to prove for the loop body, and 97% of them are of the particularly simple form evar, existential variable, whole, equals some term that is evar free. If we compare the running time for some tactics across all of the 97 simple equalities, reflexivity takes about 1.6 seconds to do all of them. Refine e grepl takes about 6 seconds. Something suspicious is going on here. If we give the arguments to e grepl fully, that drops down to 1.7 seconds. Something is going on with the implicit arguments. If we instantiate the evar ahead of time, giving the term exactly, we get a 4x speedup over reflexivity. There's something else suspicious going on here. Existential variables, as I've started to say a couple of times, are another one of the pervasive proof engine building blocks that show up often as performance bottlenecks. They are everywhere. They are created whenever a term is not given fully and they are easily forgotten. For example, if you apply the identity function to 7, there is an evar hiding there because you have not told Kopp the type of 7. Kopp knows that 7 is a nap, but it will still first create an evar before unifying it with nap. And they hold a copy of the entire context. And this turns many operations that should be constant into being linear in the size of the context, introduces many performance bottlenecks. They are created by literally every tactic that changes the goal, except for change and move, because Falk represents the goal as an evar. They are behind some of the performance bottlenecks in rewrite, and they occur whenever you pass terms to tactics. If we ask how big was the context, is in fact the performance bottleneck a result, in our case, of a large context? The answer is that we had somewhere between 187 and 379 variables in the context, in part because we wanted to avoid superlinear blow up of goal size. And if we, and part of why it's so big is because we got rid of the overeager clearing, so it's coming back to bite us now. If we now introduce clearing to drop the context size down to two or three variables, we get a 35x to 45x speed up except if we're using instantiate when we only get a 5x speedup. 
there's something suspicious going on there. The downside of this is that it takes about 25 seconds to clear the context across all of our goals. It is not worth it because we were only buying 1.6 seconds, 1.5 seconds. This is the problem with whack-a-mole. You try one thing to remove one performance bottleneck and you hit another performance bottleneck. We, you can, and I did, inline various bits of the context early, give up on, the, on avoiding a super linear proof term. And this does buy us uh, the last five seconds. I've got the timing down to about 10 seconds. But it might come back to bite us in larger examples where the asymptotics of the goal size start mattering more. There's in general a trade-off in Koch between having smaller contexts and smaller goals that an adequate proof engine would not require us to make. There's no reason that these things should depend super linearly or perhaps even linearly on the size of the context. The third example that I want to talk about is rewriting. Rewriting is hard for dumb reasons, for interesting technical reasons, and for reasons that contain research level technical challenges. Here you see a list of reasons that I am calling dumb. Of the, all of the numbers are top issue numbers. Some of them are now fixed, others are still open. You see on the first two lines the pervasive proof engine building blocks, existential variables, and unification and conversion. Rewriting also invokes fixed point refolding, which as I've said is the performance bottleneck behind the notorious slowness of simple. It also invokes type class resolution in some cases, another notorious performance bottleneck. In two issues, it is slow because of universes, and in two issues, it is slow for as yet undiagnosed reasons. The main example that I have of interesting technical reasons that rewriting is hard is that it is hard to build a rewrite that doesn't duplicate the entire goal at every rewrite location. Rewrite strap is a little bit better than this, but it still incurs a super linear cost in the proof size, uh, sorry, of the proof size in the number of rewrite locations and the size of the goal. Finally, rewriting is hard for reasons that contain research level technical challenges when binders are involved, when it is quite tricky to generate a linearly sized proof term, and it is even more tricky to do this in linear time. And as far as I know, it's an open problem to do this if you are using un only well-typed incremental modular primitives, i.e. staying within the proof engine rather than leaving the proof engine to build the proof term. And finally, even if you manage to do all of that, or you leave the proof engine, you throw it away, and you build your proof term separately, it is still, as far as I know, an open problem to get Hawk to type check that proof term in linear time with QED. We hope you now believe that performance modular proof engines are important. I really hope you believe that we don't have one yet, <laughs> and we don't even know how to spec one. This is why I'm saying that Poppelmark for proof engines would be a great first step. I believe the field should be approaching this problem systematically. And to do that, we need a measuring stick, we need benchmarks, and perhaps we need a call to action. And we are looking for the underlying building blocks, not just a factor tactic for this case or for that case. It should work for automating all of the cases, all of the kinds of proof goals that we want. And building a framework to evaluate these primitives is part of the quest of Poppelmark for proof engines. Our questions, what are the right incremental modular building blocks for conversion? How should binders and contexts be represented? What asymptotic performance is even adequate for the various building blocks? These are some sort of starter questions that we have. What are your questions? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, cool. Um, cool talk. Uh, so it's interesting to me. So I have built a lot of automation in OCaml as opposed to using LTAC. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these issues at first, I was like, I don't have these problems, and I wasn't sure why. I realized I'd had these problems, and then I built all this infrastructure really early on. Uh, so I have things like custom simplifiers everywhere. I have custom rewriting, um, and I especially have like a, I have a lot of caching. I have these persistent tables that are storing information that I'll then later look up. That'll especially prevent me from like reducing unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this takes makes things that would have never it would have timed out take like you know like uh, milliseconds to seconds. Um, so that's been like indispensable for me. Uh, I guess I'm curious. Do you think this is more of a problem of like? Do you think this should be you know solved more at the level of the kind of fundamental like uh, definitional equality like conversion checker and so on, or or do you think these problems? Um, do you want to kind of expose interfaces that make it easy for people who aren't willing to write OCaml to kind of do the things that I was already doing? So, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think we need both of those. I think that, uh, for one, the I think there are some bottlenecks in conversion. Um, like the fact that it's, you can't, that it's an open problem to get talk to type check a linearly sized term for doing rewriting in linear time. I think that needs to be solved at the level of conversion. I think that the other thing is that uh, I don't think it's so much about writing OCaml. I think it's about whether or not you have an interface that lets you do the modular construction. Like I'm guessing, and you should tell me if I'm wrong, that you built all the proof terms and then you give them all at once to call. Uh, that... Yes, but I, I, uh, I give them to Cock in a way that I know that Cock is going to easily deal with them. Yeah. Right, but but also the thing is that you, if you want to get error messages at the location where you misbuild terms, you have to build your own error checking in. Right? Oh yeah, that that's impossible. Yeah, it just gives me confusing type errors. Right, and so that that's the whole point of having a tactic engine. You want this modular incremental construction so you that you get errors at the point that you make them. And so yes, if you if you throw away the proof engine and you build your term all at once, you can get efficiency. And the quest is how do you build a proof engine that lets you do this with the modular incremental primitives. Wait, are, wait. So when you're writing it as a tactic as opposed to a command to produce a proof, then you don't have you don't have access to things like persistent storage, like. Uh, you okay? So in or, LTAC, you barely have persistent storage. You have you sort of have to reuse the context mostly. Okay. Um, if you're going under binders, you really lose access to any sort of persistent storage that you want to pass back because, especially if you want your persistent storage to be well typed in whatever context you're talking about. Um, LTAC2 does a little bit better. Uh, you do get mutable references and persistent storage. Part of the problem is that you can't reuse this for any sort of built-in primitives. Like you can't have persistent storage for is this clearable? Because Calk will redo the clear check anyway and it will ignore your, your caching there. Right? And you also can't get the primitive tactics of Calk to interface with your persistent storage. You can't say, please let me know when like any of this list of variables has been cleared from the context or something, you have to update that manually. And so there's, you you sort of have to maintain them completely separately. And I, I'm claiming we should be able to integrate them somehow. Cool. Good questions? Other questions? Thoughts? Discussion? Um, Mike might mention my favorite uh, bugbear. Uh, about uh, call by need uh, coming to bite you. Uh, so the uh, one of the hard things be, uh, with conversion is that there's a tension between doing reduction and doing uh, comparison, which you sort of sort of showed up on your factorial example. Yeah, I can go back to. Um, and uh, the whole thing about call by need, which is sharing reductions. Uh, can uh, interfere quite badly uh, if you're doing uh, if you're trying to do comparison uh, at a time, and you can basically have one conversion that's being done on doing part of a type check uh, of a type checking comparison uh, being shared in a in a place where you really don't want to do this uh, this evaluation. Right, and I I'm claiming that again the. The issue is that you like heuristics are useful, and that's another example of it's hard to figure out what the right heuristics are. And so we should have the option of something like parameterizing conversion over how it should be done, or going into a mode where we just get error messages or warnings whenever we hit this sort of so, for, uh, so actually, you, could, you can actually see this in the ex example. So if you imagine that the 10 times factorial 9 term was uh, being shared and there's some point where you want to check that it's non-zero. So then starting to evaluate it is a good idea because uh, 
it's, uh, it's going to be linear time to actually get a first successor to tell you, oh, yes, actually, that's not zero. Um, so that's going to go quite fast. But then this is going to force your uh, the, the wrong expansion. Right, so you'll end up reducing... Regardless of whether the, uh, the heuristic would have been to expand the other side first. Mm, right, so if you need to expand this somewhere else to check that, then it gets pre-expanded here. And then you can't even do this comparison because one side is already partially unfolded. Uh, and the sharing reduction here looks roughly like once you expand out all of the factorials on this side, and then you go to reduce 9 factorial, uh, reducing it in one place would unfold it in all of them at the same time. Yes. Without the option to leave some of them folded. And this is useful sometimes. It increases performance sometimes, but it's a heuristic, and so sometimes it is a performance bottleneck. I'm not claiming that solving any of these is easy, but that we shouldn't just take them as annoyances. We should bring them front and center and approach this systematically. Okay, I think we should uh, thank Jason again at this point.